Free Church, we're empowering people to live a life of freedom through Jesus Christ. So, get ready to hear a life-changing and life-empowering message from Pastor Terrell Taylor. Come on, put your hands together. All right. Just starting to put a little intro music as I get up and open my computer. Amen. I like that. But welcome again, and thank you for those wonderful announcements. You did preach the announcements. You preached the offering, the announcements, everything else. It's all good. Well, hey, are you all ready to hear the word? We're continuing our series, uh, Relationships Under Pressure. Has this been a blessing to you so far? Amen. I know last week, Pastor Chad and Jelana did a wonderful job. Amen. Uh, communicating and, and teaching and uh, God's word. And, and really, you know, um, our heart here, my heart, our heart here at Live Free Church is to equip people to, to live a life of freedom through Jesus Christ. And that also means having series that help us in areas of our life specifically. And that's why we are dealing with relationships. But before I jump in, I just have a few um a quick questions, and I need you to answer these, okay? I, 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 what car does Jesus drive? Anybody know? What car does Jesus drive? Somebody got to know this one. He drives a Chrysler. I'm. Uh, you guys did not know that? Oh, my, my, my. Okay. Now, answer this question for me. If Mary had Jesus and Jesus is the Lamb of God, does that mean that Mary had a little lamb? Is that... Help me some, okay, okay. I think y'all want to fire me after this week for, I just had to bring it back to test y'all to see where we were on this. Now, how does Moses make his tea? Anybody know how Moses makes his tea? He brews it. He brews it. I need my little ching over here. Okay, one, one more, one more, just one more. Now, where in the Bible is the first tennis match mentioned? Okay, the first tennis match. Where is it mentioned in the Bible? Somebody has to know this. Somebody. Okay, when Joseph served in Pharaoh's court. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Well, anyway, good morning. Good, Pastor Laura, that was just for you. That was just for you, Pastor Laura. <laughs> Pastor Laura said thank you. Right? <laughs> well, again, we're continuing our series on, uh, on relationships and, and relationships under pressure. And today, I'm going to talk about why we all struggle with anger. Can I deal with it this morning? Say it with me, why we all struggle with anger. Now, research has shown that there are five basic emotions, uh, human emotions. It's happiness, uh, fear, uh, sadness, disgust, and anger. And, and anger is also known as a secondary emotion. And anybody ever heard of anger being a secondary emotion? And, and so it's like the red light on your car dashboard, right? It's like the red light of your soul, the dashboard of your soul. If it tells you that something is wrong under the hood. Whenever you experience anger, it's telling you that something is wrong. Now, over 15 uh, years ago, and I can share this story. I think I might have shared it one other time, but it's been a long time, so I feel freer to share it as time goes on. God bless me to make 50 years last Saturday. Amen. Yes, I'm blessed. So when I was 35... <laughs> You know, I, I was in ministry full time, and we were here and uh, living in Snellville, and there was just a lot going on in my life. There was a lot of stress, you know. There was some financial stress, ministry stress, life stress, you know. And uh, and I was on my way uh, to drop off a book at the library there in Snellville, and I was on uh, the phone talking to my sister. And you all know here in Atlanta, they have when you can turn right and it says keep moving, right? But sometimes people yield, right, and they don't stop. Well, I was the car that it told me to keep moving, but I was on the phone, and so I yielded. I really wasn't paying attention to the keep moving sign. So I yielded, and I saw the police officer right in front of me. He's getting ready to make his left turn to my right, and I was going right. And the car, there was a white truck behind me, and they beeped their horn. Ah, 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 ah. 
And I was like, what are they beeping their horn for? Uh, so I, I, I got moving, right? I was angry. I had a little bit of road rage. And I got over in the lane, and he came up on the side of me, and I act like I was going to hit him. And the cop saw everything. So he put on his lights, and I went into the library. Now, remember, I was going to drop off my library. But guess what I did? I had no sense. It, road rage will make you do stupid stuff. I stopped, and I said, officer, I'm putting my book in this library before you give me a ticket. So I got out the car, put my book in the library. Thing. He says, what are you doing? He says, I pulled you over. You should stay in your car. And then the other guy, he came in who I act like I was going to hit. I was just acting. Anybody acted before? He gets out the car. He's an older white gentleman. Oh, son, son, I, I, you really shouldn't be doing that. The police officer's upset. And I get I'm like, I'm so sorry. He's like, yeah, I'm a deacon at my church. And I said, oh, I didn't want to tell him I'm a minister. <laughs> he said, you know, my, my son's a police officer, and he sees a whole lot of things happen. You know, young man, you just shouldn't be doing that. And I said, I know, I'm sorry. I repented there, but it didn't get me out of the, the ticket. So I got the ticket, and I had to go to court, and, and my brother, uh, my brother um, Marvin Oglesby, I called him, I said, Marv, you know, Marv knows everybody. He's, he's retired in, in that field. And, and I said, can you just come and support me, bro? He said, I'll, I'll be there, Pastor T. I'll be there. So he showed up. I still got the ticket, but I don't know. Marvin might have helped me in some way. He might have got my sentence reduced, something like that. But listen, that is a true story. <laughs> there, there was something going on in my life. And I learned ever since that time, I learned to turn my road rage into lame love. I came up with that. Y'all might have to use that. I had to learn to turn my road rage into lame love. No matter what lane I'm driving in, come on, I'm going to love you. No matter if you flip me off, I'm going to love you. If, you. if you cut me off, I'm going to love you. I had to get to that point because I had some serious things going on while driving a car. Anybody been there? Don't lift your hand. Oh, I saw a hand go up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just know I'm not by myself. Amen. So it's easier to be angry than to face the deeper issues in our lives. Uh, anger is not the problem, right? It's not the problem. Anger is the warning light. And if you and I are honest with ourselves and, and brave enough to look past the anger at the deeper issues of our life, we can discover the motivating factors behind our anger. Now, when people abandon us, let us down, when someone doesn't come through, we feel rejected, left out. We feel lonely, sad, or sorrowful. Usually, we cover it up with anger. These emotions are so strong, right, painful and confusing that it's easier to cover it up with anger because anger is a satisfying substitute. Anger artificially makes us feel like we're in control. You know, when I was driving, I, I was angry and I felt like I'm glad I didn't actually hit him. But I was angry. I wanted to be in control of the situation. Don't blow your horn behind me. I'm talking on the phone. But anger is a, is a satisfying substitute. Anger artificially makes us feel like we're in control when we are really feeling out of control. Anger falsely makes us feel powerful when we feel powerless. You know, we often cover, we often cover our emotions with anger when we are hurt, when we feel guilty, uh, we are experiencing shame, uh, uh, powerlessness, betrayal, insecurity, rejection. When our hopes are dashed, right? Feeling trapped, hopelessness, helplessness, unmet expectations, envy, jealousy, resentment, pride, low self-esteem, failure, sense of worldly, worthlessness, I'm sorry, when there's a sense of worthlessness, loneliness, worry, anxiety, stress, disappointment, remorse, exhaustion, fatigue, and grief. Did I miss any? Right? 
Those are lot. And those are real emotions that we as human beings face every day. We experience these emotions in our lives. But the great majority of the time, what comes up on our dashboard is the warning light of anger. And instead of dealing with our emotions in a healthy way, many times we suppress them. And then anger comes out as a secondary emotion. It comes to the surface. Some of you suppress your emotions with food, right? Some of you suppress your emotions with prescription drugs. My parents told me just yesterday that a, 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 a lady that I grew up with back in Reno, uh, she just died. She overdosed on prescription drugs, opioids. Some people are suppressing things going on with their life, with alcohol or, or other addictive substances. Some of you use pornography as a way to cover up emotional pain. Some of you turn to overspending and other reckless behaviors. And so what's happening is that you're covering stuff up, uh, you're covering things uh, on the inside, things that are going on the inside of you. You're covering those things up. But see, God wants to heal those areas of our life. God wants to forgive. God wants to restore us. You're covering up issues with anger. And guess what? We all struggle with it. But God wants to use your anger. God wants to use my anger to help us instead of making us prisoners. Amen? Now, I just read about 30 underlining cases of anger, right? All those emotions. But when you pull them all together, you basically come up with three big categories. And I'm going to go over these three categories. Number one, we get angry because of unmet needs. All right? Write that down. We get angry because of unmet needs. I'm going to call this hurt. Anybody been hurt before, right? You know, you, you have a need to talk, but someone doesn't want to talk to you, and so you get hurt, right? You know, I have a need to be connected, but people don't want to be your friend. Well, you know, then you, you get hurt, right? Well, I have a need for someone to come through for me at a point in my life that I'm desperate. And, you know, I have a need to be loved. All these are real needs that we have. Proverbs 27 and 4, it says this, anger is cruel and fury overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? Wow. You know, we're doing our study in Proverbs and these uh, amazing, amazing points of, of, of truth and how we, we can live our lives uh, in, in a way that is a blessing, in a way that is successful in God's eyes and in God's kingdom. That's what the Proverbs is all about, helping us uh, put our, our, the rubber where the rubber meets the road, right? And so Proverbs here, it says, anger is cruel and fury overfell, uh, overwhelming, but who can stand against jealousy? This verse shows us that although anger can be cruel, that that there's an emotion of unmet needs called jealousy. And jealousy is rooted in hurt. Jealousy is resentment of someone uh, uh, or their achievements. You resent them because of their achievement, possessions, or perceived advantages. That's what's going on in our society today. Well, this, this ethnic group and, and these people and, oh, why do these, you know, jealousy we have perceived we perceive people in certain ways and so we we see their accomplishments but think those things should belong to us a classical uh, a classic biblical example of jealousy is the story of joseph in genesis the 37th chapter and the fourth verse it says this when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them oh that's going to cause problems parents this note to self this is not how to raise a family but he loved them more. He loved Joseph more than any of them. They hated him. Who? His brothers hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. 
we see here uh, that there is a father, Jacob, who shows partiality and gives Joseph the nice coat of many colors. He, he gives Joseph the easy job of checking in on his brothers, right? He gives Joseph all the attention. He's the son of his favorite wife, Rachel. And, and now the other brothers who have, who have different mothers, they feel hurt. They feel rejected. They feel that this favored treatment of Joseph isn't fair to them. They want the same love and affection from their father. And so what do they do? What do they do? They become angry. They take their anger out on the object receiving the attention. Isn't that interesting, right? They don't take their anger out on their dad, <laughs> who's the one showing the partiality. They don't take it out on Jacob. They take it out on their brother Joseph. Why? Because they are hurt, and Joseph is the easier object to be angry with. I have found this to be true even in my own life, in my own household. There have been times when, when I was upset or I was hurt, you know, with whether I was upset with myself or somebody else. But I took it out on my wife. I took it out on my kids instead. Why? Because they were the objects that were the, in that moment I could just be angry with, <laughs> Right? They were the objects that I could focus my anger on. I knew they weren't going anywhere. I knew that they weren't a church member who might leave. I knew they weren't a friend who might say, listen, I don't want to be your friend anymore. I knew they weren't an employer who might want to fire me. They are my wife and my kids, and they ain't going nowhere. So it's easier to take anger out on those Who's going to love you through it? But you try that with, you know, I know somebody who's had about 150 jobs. I tell them, listen, you need to write a book, How to Get a Job in Two Minutes. But time and time again, they got upset with their boss and, you know, and they got fired. You know, you don't talk to your supervisor that way. You don't talk to, you know, but we'll, we'll do that. We can talk to our spouses. We can talk to our children. People that we know ain't going nowhere. <laughs> oh, am I by myself? I know I'm being transparent, but I feel like y'all looking at me like, Pastor, you're the only one with that issue. Okay, praise God. Well, I can move on. I saw, I saw some agreement. No, Pastor. Okay, praise God. Thank you. But listen, I had some unmet needs, right? I had some hurts in my life that I allowed to boil over in anger instead of taking those needs to God in prayer. One of the reasons why I love the Psalms so much is because 25% of the Psalms are made up of emotionally charged prayers to God. God, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And why are they, you know, why are they prospering? And I'm over here, you know, man, I love the Psalms because it's just real authentic prayer. <laughs> so listen, God can handle it, right? Whatever your prayer is, God can handle it. He can handle anything that we bring to him. Funny story about 25 years ago and when, when I was uh, at Oral Roberts University. It's funny how you get old that stories get longer. Like, what? 25 years? Like, I'm old. But about 25 years ago, I was at Oral Roberts University, and I, I traveled uh, with a singing group. Uh, we traveled for about a month and a half all over uh, the United States, the East Coast, and we also went to, to Russia. And we had about 15 people uh, on our team. And so there, there, you know, there was a young man on our team who, you know, he had just had enough with the drama that was going on. You know, when you travel with people and you're around them, they're like family for a month and a half, and you're going to see every part of them. I mean, we were fussing and arguing before we had to get on stage. Da, da, da. This co the, the, the curtains open up. Hey, praise God. Behind the curtain, we were at each other. One, one, one of the young ladies uh, bit somebody, and he he's probably still has a scar in his arm. This is like people who are traveling the world preaching and singing the good news of Jesus Christ. There was some drama going on. And, and so... Uh, after our trip, you know, this young man, he, he confided 
with me. And this is what he said. He said, you know, Terrell, you remember uh, when such and such happened to me and, and I became really, really angry. And, 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 and I said, yeah, I remember that. And he said, well, you know, I was so upset. He said, I went to the bathroom, sat on the toilet, and shouted to God at the top of my lungs with every curse word that I knew. Come, don't act religious on here. Y'all got quiet. <laughs> he said, man, I got it all out, and I felt so much better. I said, you know, bro, I, I, I don't recommend that you pray like that, but hey, God can handle it. Come on, somebody say God can handle it. Come on, let's be real. I'd rather, I'd rather take cuss words to God who can handle it than cuss somebody else and something crazy go wrong, right? Because there's been people who said the wrong thing to the wrong person and something didn't go too well for them. So, so listen, God can handle it. And that is my point. He can handle whatever frustration, whatever hurt, whatever pain you are going through, whatever unmet needs you have in your life. Would you take it to him in prayer and allow him to heal your hurt? Listen, that's what he is here for as our father. And not only is it important to communicate with God, your unmet needs and your frustrations and your hurts. But it's important to also to communicate with the person that you feel has upset you. And this is the hard part. <laughs> A good way to do this is to use the words, I feel. OK, I feel abandoned when you do this or I feel rejected when you say this or I feel insecure when you do this. I feel hurt. There are a lot of emotions that we can express to our spouse or our, our family member or our coworker or a friend by using the words I feel. And listen, this again, this is not easy to do. And I'm learning and I'm even growing this in this with my wife. We had a conversation the other day. She said, man, your mood just changed. I said, I know because I felt the, and I should have said it when the mood changed. But I waited about two or three days later. <laughs> not good. But I was like, okay, why am I feeling like this? Because, well, I had an expectation over here or an unmet need, right? And so it brought up this emotion and I went silent. And Tara was like, what is going on with you? You have more moods than anybody I know. And she's probably correct in some of that. But it's, it's not easy, right, to, to the, the person who upsets you to go to them and say, listen, I feel like this. And your feelings are valid. They are. We all, God gave us feelings and we all have them. Now, the, the, the feelings are valid. It might not make the whole situation valid, but your feelings are valid and you need to communicate that. Amen. It's easier, though, to go to the extremes, right, and become silent, or to lash out. It's easier to do that than to say, hey, I feel this way, right? You become passive and, and you become silent or you become aggressive. You hold things in or you use sarcasm as a way to deal with your hurt. But if you learn to communicate with I feel, it will go a long way in helping you in your struggle with anger. Everybody, let's say I feel. Come on, we're going to practice this. I feel. I feel some kind of way when I see a person with hair. I feel. We can do it. We're going to be all right. Amen. So listen, remember, you have to attack the issue and not the person. Amen. Amen. Attack the issue and not the person because God wants uh, you and us. He wants us to use the secondary emotion of anger for our good. Remember, anger is the warning light that signals something is going on. Are y'all tracking with me this morning? Amen. All right, let's move to point number two. The second reason we also get angry is this unmet expectations. Everybody say unmet expectations come on say that again unmet expectations now i'm, I'm going to call this uh, frustration because I, I i i have a degree in frustration i have a ba in frustration did anybody else have a ba in frustration <laughs> 
Pastor Lee said, I got a doctorate in frustration. <laughs> Unmet expectations, right? I expect others to be available when I need them, or I expect people to return my calls and my emails or my text messages. I expect people to do what they said they would do, right? And when they don't, guess what? I get mad, and so do you. Frustration is real. It, it, it's real, right? It, frustration can be real or perceived, but, but it's real because of unmet expectations. The distance between what you expect to happen and what really happens can lead you down the road of frustration. A lot of our anger is because of unmet expectations. I don't know if you know this, and it might come to a surprise to you, but guess what? People cannot read your mind. Did you know that? Did, did, did you know that people can't read your mind? <laughs> you have expectations in your head. And people don't know that they are there, right? You were raised in a certain way with expectations of what people should and should not do. What people should say and, and should not say. How many people should drive and, and, you know, how people should drive and should not drive. <laughs> That man who blew his horn at me, you know, should have, have known that I was, on, again, I was on the phone with my sister on the way to my library. He should, have, he should have been able to read my mind. Well, you know, we know the story, right? And so here, Proverbs 14 and 29, it, show, it tells us this. Listen to this. This is such a, 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 a powerful verse. Whoever is what? Oh, come on. Somebody say that loud. Whoever is. Patient has great understanding. But who is but one who is quick tempered displays folly. Some translations say it like this in the contemporary uh, English version. It's smart to be patient, but it's stupid to lose your temper. <laughs> wow. Another translation says slow to anger, right, or, or slow to wrath. Well, that word for Mama Carmen in, in, in the Hebrew is for Mama Carmen today, patient, amen. And it means long-suffering. It means long-suffering before getting angry. That's the Hebrew meaning of that word patient. Isn't that powerful? It means patience before getting angry. And this verse shows us that our anger is linked to our expectations. And when our expectations are not met, we become impatient and quick-tempered. How many remember the story of Naaman in Kings, right? 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to go there. Listen, he was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. And let's look at the second king, uh, Kings, the fifth chapter, verses 9 through 12. That I mean, Naaman was somebody, y'all, right? Whenever you're the head of an army, you somebody. You, you got some swag, right? And so it says here, so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. That was the prophet Elisha after Elijah, okay? So get this, right? He stops at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Wow, you thought he started to have a praise party right there. Come on, somebody. But what does he do? It says, but Naaman went away what? Angry. And he said, I thought that he would surely come out to meet me because I'm the commander of an army and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God. Uh-oh. Wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar and, ooh, Farpar. Are not Abana and Farpar. Now, don't go name your kids these river names, okay? The rivers of Damascus, what? Better, are they not better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and been cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Wow. We can just pause the story, just let that. Really, this man just did that? <laughs> How many times have you told God the way he has to work in your life? 
How many times has your expectation of others fallen short of what you might thought of was the best way to do something, huh? How many times is life not fair? You know, I expected my marriage to be trouble-free. You know, when I got married, I expected a trouble-free marriage. Everybody say, no, you didn't. Right? I had another expectation. I expected to have hair throughout my life. When I was born, I had that expectation, Brother Bobby. Amen? I expected, right, this church to to be a certain size after so many years of pastoring. That was another one of my expectations. But you know, so much of our anger is linked to pride and impatience. Wow. I know it's quiet in this house. God is getting all on. He, he, He dealing with all of us in here this morning. We all in the same boat. Hallelujah. But you know, so much of our anger, it's linked to pride and impatience. First of all, the prophet Elijah didn't even greet Naaman. He didn't even go to the door. And he sent his servant to go talk to Naaman. So then Naaman was told to go down to the lowly Jordan River, but he wanted to go to the rivers of his own country. Guess what that's called? Pride. He was also told, right, to dip seven times, not one, two, or three, but seven. Who has time to dip seven times when they're busy commanding an army? (laughs) Well, I don't have time for this. Well, Well, that's what you call impatience. But guess what, Mr. Naaman? Guess what? God is in charge, not you. Somebody say God's in charge. Come on, say God's in charge. Come on. I know we think we are, but God's in charge. You go and do what I told you to do. That's what God is saying to Naaman. And so here, let's pick up the story in verse 13. And we're going to see here, it says, Naaman's servants went to him. You remember, he stormed off in a rage. So the servants, his servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, because, you know, he's used to doing great things. People who command armies, they get there for a reason. He says, if he had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you wash and be cleansed? So he went down. So Naaman began to listen to those uh, servants. And he said, so he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Let me give you a little tool that will help you with your unmet expectations, okay? It's the words I desire. It's the words I hope for or I pray instead of the word I demand. Okay? Demands sound like this. You should, you always, you ought to, you never. Those are demand words. And when you hear yourself saying those words, those are demands, right? When you say you should do this, or my spouse always does that, or my kids never call, or my marriage should be more fulfilling all the time. Guess what? Those are demand words. You might say, I ought to make more money, or I never get promoted. Listen, should, always, ought, and never are demand statements that that we sometimes even make over our own lives. I should be this, or I always struggle with that, or I ought to do this perfectly, or I'm, I'm never good enough. And so some of you, you get mad not only at others, but even at yourself. But I got good news for you. There is only one Jesus, amen, and you ain't it. There's only one Jesus, and you ain't him. You're not going to be perfect. Now, I know Tara, she thought I was really close to that when she met me, amen. I changed that in about one hour. But we're not perfect. There's always going to be unmet expectations in our lives. The only one who will never let you down is Jesus. But even in that, his disciples,
disciples, amen, they had unmet expectations. They thought Jesus was going to take over Rome and, and he was going to ascend to the throne. They didn't think he was going to go to the cross. Unmet expectations. But God can help us, right? He can help us. So when, when we start to, to, to use demand statements, what we should really start to say is, listen, I desire or I hope, or I'm praying for this. I desire to have a fulfilling and a deep marriage, even in this fallen world. Or I have a desire to have an incredible relationship with my kids. Or I hope to one day, you know, own my own business or, or to work my way up in this company. You know, I'm believing that God is going to bless me with a new home. Amen? Using words like desire and hope will go a long way in helping you deal with unmet expectations. When you have a desire that doesn't come through, guess what? We all experience disappointment. And we all experience disappointment in life. But when you have demands that don't come through, guess what? That leads to anger. So many of, of my uh, anger issues and, 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 and your anger issues, guess what? They are rooted in unconscious expectations. And many times we don't even know they are there. I have expectations of my wife, my kids, amen, my church, and an expectation of friends. Guess what? Like I said earlier, no one can read your mind. You have to communicate that is the hard part. But if we're going to grow, right, if we're going to grow in this area of our life, if we're going to overcome anger and we're going to allow God to use it as a tool to help us become more of who we are, guess what? These are the ways to do it. My last point is this. Number three, the third reason why we get so angry is because of insecurity. Everybody say insecurity. Oh, man, y'all said that like you're insecure. Say it like you're secure. Say insecurity. That's much better. <laughs> Listen, when you're personally attacked or you are threatened, it might be a real or perceived attack on your worth, but it leads to insecurity. Often anger is merely the evidence of insecurity in our lives. Remember, anger is the red light flashing on the dashboard of your soul. Proverbs 15 and 1 says this, a gentle answer turns away anger. It turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Contemporary English uh, version says a kind answer soothes angry feelings, but harsh words stir them up. That word there in the Hebrew for gentle and, and also translated as kind, it's a word that means tender. It means uh, pertaining to an attitude or behavior which is not harsh. As a positive moral quality of kindness or responsiveness. So what this is saying is, listen, a, 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 a gentle answer, a, 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 a words that are not harsh, guess what? They turn away anger. But what does harshness does? Well, that, what does harsh does? It, 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 it's a word here in the Hebrew. It means communication through speech, which is critical and unduly cruel, <laughs> causing someone mental anguish. Wow. That's what the Hebrew meaning of harshness is. So when you use harsh words, whether it's in a sarcastic way or, or critical or you're demeaning people, you're tearing them down, guess what? That's going to stir up anger in them. Parents, note, note, note to self, listen, when you speak to your kids, listen, you need to talk to them in a way that is not going to tear them down but build them up. Even in correcting them, the, the goal is to build them up up spouses don't use words that are going to tear your mate down listen you know i've said things to tear and as soon as i said it i said oh come back but guess what I, they, they don't come back they go out in the atmosphere they go into her heart and her mind and she's damaged she's hurt because of my harsh words we all been there married folks amen amen 
Single people, same thing. Listen, use your words to build up and, and to love people and to sue. You know, and I'm not talking about you just go soft on the truth, but there's always a way to deliver the truth, right? There's a way to, to, to approach people and, and to, to speak and communicate in ways that they feel valued and they feel loved and they feel appreciated. But what does a harsh word do? Listen. What does criticism do? What does someone calling you uh, a name do? What does someone calling you out your name do? It, well, these harsh words stir up anger because your personhood is now attacked. Your value has been attacked. Proverbs 18, 19 says, A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a castle. Listen, it's easier to conquer a strong city than to win back a friend whom you've offended. Anybody ever been offended? Anybody ever offend someone? All of us, right? You know, but when, when, when a person is offended, their walls go up, <laughs> making it nearly impossible to, to win them back. But listen, when you are attacked, your personhood and security are attacked. That's where we get the word in security. In that word there, that prefix means not. <laughs> so when we are attacked, that leads to insecurity. We are offended, and the bars go up in our lives. The bars go up when someone has been unfaithful. When someone has hurt you, when someone has talked bad about you, the bars go up when someone has misrepresented you, when the boss takes the credit for the work you've done, when a parent doesn't talk to you after a game because you're the coach and you make a decision that they don't like. I had to get that off my chest. Me and my son, we coached. I let him head coach the last few games. He got us some great wins. I should have let him coach from the beginning of the season. But we had a parent who ain't talking to neither one of us, and we're like, your son ain't good. Don't get an attitude with me. My son is carrying the team. That's not a prideful statement. It's true. Go play basketball. Don't kick the ball. You got to teach him how to dribble. And if you're watching, I don't know if you're watching. You're probably not. Anyway. Those things happen, right? <laughs> Bars go up. We get offended. Like that parent did. He's not even hardly talk. I'm like, really, bro? Really? This is rec league. And most of these kids will not be playing basketball in about three years. Including yours. But I can go on and on and on and on and on about how we get offended, how people are offended, right? And listen, we all deal with insecurities. We all deal with it. Why? Because we get it from our daddy, Adam. <laughs> Adam. And in, in the third chapter of Genesis, it says, and, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called, God called to Adam and said to him, listen, where are you? And this was after they had sinned, right? And, and so he said, I heard your voice. These are the words of Adam to God. He said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Listen, Adam felt insecure. Adam felt insecure inadequate he's self-conscious for the very first time and that inadequacy produces fear that is ultimately rooted in shame insecurity creates a fear of others seeing me as i am and so what i hide some people use pride as a cover-up for insecurity they tell you how many people they re uh, report to them and how much money they make and what kind of car they drive and where they live, right? I call it the victor mentality. Others have a victim mentality. <laughs> they walk around with their heads down. They tell you all their sad stories and all the bad things that have happened to them. And when you see them at church, you go the other way because you've heard all their stories, <laughs> But guess what? Both the victor mentality and the victim mentality 
keep people at a distance. Whether it's pride that is rooted in insecurity or shame that is rooted in insecurity. I remember years and years and years ago, I was uh, tr doing some traveling and, and uh, with a, a well-known worship artist, and he took me uh, with him to Florida, and we went and we led worship, and actually he was sick, so I had to lead more of the worship, and, and it was a powerful experience. And, and um, he introduced me to the pastor because they were looking for a worship leader, and so that was kind of the, the reason why I traveled with this artist. And and uh, I got to talking to the pastor, and he said to me and my wife, he said, you know, we, we got in a little bit of conversation. He said, you know, no one ever comes to my house. And I'm like, what? He said, no, I don't want anybody ever coming to my house. Matter of fact, this man you sit right here is the only one who's ever been to my house. I'm like, what is wrong with you? I can't come work for you if I'm never, ever going to be at your house. I like to eat. He was a bishop. He's on TV, all this stuff. And I'm like, this man ain't going to work for me. You know that? I don't know why he's like that, but obviously there's some insecurities. There's some walls that have gone up because now he keeps people at a distance. Man, when we started this church, we had everything in our house. We had praise team rehearsals and, 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 and small groups and all kind of stuff. Man, our little houses got ran through. So I couldn't, I'm like, really? You've never had any of your leadership team or any of your men? What? I can't come here. <laughs> but when we realize, right, whether it's pride or, or it's shame or we're afraid, guess what? When we realize that our only security we truly have is in Christ, listen, we don't have to walk around like the ultimate victor or the ultimate victim. Because our security is in Christ alone. Amen. We don't have to live behind walls of pride or, or walls of, of shame. We can live in the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. And that's what he wants. He wants us to be transparent and open and honest and, and authentic. He doesn't want us to hide behind our insecurities. Listen, ain't last, remember last time I checked, ain't nobody in here Jesus. So what does he want? He wants his, his sons and his daughters to be real and authentic and do life together. And guess what? That is going to mean sometimes there will be bumps in the road because we are all on our journey of being healed. All of us. Healing is not a destination. It is a journey. And when we do this life together and we're loving God and we're loving each other, guess what? And, 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 and we're being real and we can handle the stuff that comes, whether it's unmet expectations or unmet needs. And we can learn how to communicate not only as husbands and wives, as children and parents, as, as friends, right, as a church family. We will move forward in life much better when we apply these tools that we learned in our life this morning. Amen. Praise God. Yes, give God a hand clap. So in my conclusion, I want to say this. Listen, your anger, my anger, our anger, instead of being, listen, your worst nightmare, your anger can be your best friend, okay? But you have to have the courage to look below the surface of anger. You have to have the courage to really look at the issues in your life. And that's what many people really don't want to do. We want to go through life with issues, holding on to issues, allowing those issues to bring anger up, not dealing with the issues. In fact, God wants to use your anger, my anger, as a tool that will serve us and help us become all that we are purposed to be. I bet you didn't know we were going there this morning, right? Anger is a tool, and God wants to use it. Last scripture, Ephesians 4 and 26, it says, be what? This is one of my favorite ones I love to quote. Tara's like, I think that the scripture says be angry. But what does it say, though? But do not sin. Don't let the sun go down before you have dealt with what? 
the cause. That's the complete Jewish Bible translation. Powerful. I want to leave that up there for just a moment. It says, be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down before what? You have dealt with the cause of your anger. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we are learning ways to allow anger in our life to be a tool for us to be more whole and, and to use uh, anger as a tool to address the issues in our lives, whether they are unmet needs or unmet expectations or, or insecurity. God, we want to grow. Lord, we want to be more whole today than we were yesterday. God, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us this morning. And the things, when, when we're, we're experiencing things in, in life and anger comes to the surface, help us pause and say, okay, what is the cause? This is the engine light on my dashboard going off, but there's something under the hood. And Father, I pray right now that you bring to our mind and our hearts people and persons who hurt us. Lord, help us deal with the hurt and rejection and, and the pain of being hurt. You know, I felt this way when this person did this to me, you know, and, I, and, and I've gone throughout my life now with this undermining issue. Father, let us help us. Give us the courage to forgive. To forgive that mom or that dad or that uncle or that aunt or that grandparent or that neighbor people who've hurt us, God. Give us the courage to forgive. Help us release the anger and the bitterness against them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you might even be angry at God. Listen, release that. God is in control. We don't, we won't understand. We will never understand all the whys. But this is what I want you to know. God loves you. God has the best for you. It might not look like what you want it to look like. It might have not turned out the way that you wrote in, in, in your book, your novel of your life. It might have not turned anywhere, any, anything close to what, what that you wanted your life to be. Early in my marriage, Tara was diagnosed with, with bipolar, and I've, we've shared our story many, many times. But guess what? I, I didn't have, I, that wasn't in my novel for my life and my wife and my marriage, for her to be in a mental hospital three times over the holidays. No, I was angry at God. I was hurt. I was broken. But guess what? I'm not in control. God is. And so when things happen in our life, it would be wise for us to allow God to get us through those things, get us through those hurts, get us through those sicknesses, and get us through those financial difficulties, and, and to help us. And that's why you need a church family. That's why you need people who will pray for you and, and love you and encourage you in the place that you are. Because if you're not going through, you're on your way to going through. <laughs> and that's what this is all about. God wants us to be more whole so that we can then help others. And, and we won't allow anger to divide us. We live in a very divisive country right now. Why? Because that spirit is not of God. Anger and people killing and people shooting and people doing this and that. It's all over the headlines all the time. Guess what? That is not the spirit of God. That is the spirit of anti-Christ. That is the spirit of anti-God. Murder, anger. See, that, that's why scripture says don't allow it to go down. Don't allow the sun to go down on your wrath or your anger. Deal with it. And as believers, as sons and daughters, God has given us his word. He's given us the tools to allow us to go through this life, 
being angry but sinning not. Amen. And so, Father, I thank you for the healing. I thank you for the restoration. I thank you, God, that people will no longer have road rage today, God. We won't be people filled with anger because people don't agree with us politically or people don't see eye to eye with us on this issue. God, help us not be people who are filled with anger and bitterness. No, God, we are people that have a hope beyond this life and our hope is in Christ. And I pray that for all of those watching, all of those here, may we be those who bring hope to this dying world where the enemy is using people to bring anger and division. Division. We are going to bring hope. Amen. The love of God. And we're going to allow people to know that there is security in Christ alone. So thank you, Father, for helping us today. Thank you for this word. That, Lord, your seeds of your word and your truth went deep into our hearts. And it is going to produce in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, let's give God a hand praise. Amen. Let's give God a hand praise. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I pray that that word blessed you today. I pray that it helped you, challenged you. And uh, next week we're going to continue our series uh, in, in uh, uh, relationships under pressure. And uh, I pray that you would join us because, listen, these are the five reasons why we exist. To worship God with what? Passion and expression. To share the good news of Jesus with others. To connect with other believers in meaningful relationships. To empower leaders to fulfill their God-given destiny. And to prepare what? Disciples. To impact present day crazy culture. We're going to add that word crazy in there next time. But amen. You be blessed. We are empowered to be people who are living lives of freedom through Jesus Christ. We will see you next week, family. God bless. We hope you enjoyed today's message and pray that you experience the freedom God has for you through his son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 8 verse 36 says, if the son gives you freedom, you are free. If you would like more information about Live Free Church, please visit us on the web at www.livefreechurch.org.